There were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. But one was out on the hills away, far off from the gates of gold, away on the mountains, wild and bare, away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast here thy ninety and nine. Are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, this of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. But none of the ransom ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was that night that the Lord passed through ere he found his sheep that was lost. Out in the desert he heard its cry, sick and a helpless and a ready to die, sick and helpless and a ready to die. But all through the mountains thunder riven and up from the rocky steep there arose a glad cry to the gates of heaven rejoice i have found my sheep and the angels echoed around the throne rejoice for the lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Amen. Praise the Lord. Keep your Bible open there to Matthew 24. This is a, not a topic that I typically would speak about on Sunday mornings, but I became burdened throughout the week this week to bring it thinking a lot about the resurrection, of course, with Easter last Sunday. And so I'll bring the thought, Charles Taze Russell, false prophet, false prophet. Jesus, if you stay there in Matthew 24, please, Jesus is sitting on the western slopes of the Mount of Olives, and he's looking down on the city of Jerusalem. If you can picture the Lord with his, his disciples there, just a few moments ago, his disciples had followed him from Jerusalem, Jesus had left the temple. He's in the temple. As he walks out of the temple, he tells his disciples these words. He says to his inner circle, he says, This temple that we were just in will be destroyed, this incredible structure. Not one stone will be left upon another. Complete destruction. We're going to take a little few more steps into this chapter, and then that'll springboard us into the thought for today. Would you bow your heads with me one last time, and let's submit ourselves to the Lord this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to be used. Holy Spirit, we ask your blessing, all the preparation, all the study, all the effort to bring us to this point for this service, Lord. Lord, uh, that your truth would go forward. Lord, that you would guide us and your spirit would do the speaking. Lord, please help us now in what we've prepared, what you have prepared and laid on our heart to bring to your people this morning. Bless now, help us to have ears to hear what the spirit of God would say to the church today. In Christ's name we ask, amen. 
Of course, his disciples wanted answers about the temple being wiped out, being destroyed, the Solomon's temple, the rebuilt temple. They follow Jesus off to the Mount of Olives, and there they are sitting together. And uh, they ask him an obvious question. Go back in chapter 24. Look at verse 3, please. Look at verse 3 with me. And uh, they ask him the question, please tell us, when shall these things come to pass? When will the temple be destroyed? And what shall be the sign of thy coming, his return to the earth? Because he's going to leave. And when will be the signs, uh, what will be the signs of the end of the world? See that there in verse 3. Jesus responds as we read through the chapter, and we were not going to take time to read through the whole chapter, but if you glance through Matthew 24, you hear the words of the Lord there. He says, before the end of the world, here are some things that have to happen first. Right before the end of the world, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be famines and pestilence. There will be earthquakes. The whole world will be an unrest and upheaval. When we gravitate in the Sermon on the Mount and in these verses as Jesus is speaking uh, uh, to, to his disciples, we gravitate to the, 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 the giant events, the earthquakes, the catastrophic things that are going to happen. We gravitate to all of these horrible things that are going to come to pass, these wars and all of this that will take place right at the end during those latter days. But Jesus wasn't done. Look at verse number 24. We just read it. There, there shall arise, here is, we're in the latter days now, before the end of the world, there shall arise false Christs. These are people who profess to be Christ or saviors. They come as a Christ. They come as a uh, sent from God. False prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. These are cults. These are cult leaders. These are leaders who appear to be Christian. They even take words that are Christian, and they are counterfeit. They'll, the Bible says they shall arise in those days first. Counterfeit Christianity will arise in mass toward the end times. And Paul was only one of many of the 12 apostles who talked about this and made a big deal about this. Warning, it's demonic. It's of Satan. Satan is trying to get as many people to hell as he can. Satan is trying to peep, keep as peep, many people out of heaven as he can. And so uh, if you want to turn there, you can quickly. I'm going to read it for us. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 1, please. And I'll move as quickly as I can. I have a lot to say this morning uh, that the Lord has given us. I don't know how much of it. It, we'll get to, but notice in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1 and 2, the apostle Paul, the great apostle, he says, the spirit, or speaking of capital S, the spirit of God, speaketh expressly, that word expressly means very plain, God is very plain about this, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing, notice small s, spirits, and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, to be when your conscience is seared with a hot iron, here's what it means. It means the mind becomes cauterized. Not cauterized. When you think of cauterization, you think of the body, and they'll use an instrument to cauterize the blood and stop the blood so they can prevent infection in the body. That's why they'll use cauter uh, cauterizing tools to prevent infection. But when false prophets come, their minds will be cauterized, and then those that they lead and those that uh, they can gather to follow them, they will have minds that are cauterized or hardened, and they will be cut off. Their mind will be cut off from what really is the truth. Their minds will be cut off from the truth of what the Word of God really says. Don't forget this book right here. This book is a spiritual book. If someone doesn't know God through His Son, Jesus Christ, they can't understand this book. They are darkened. They don't, they don't have the Spirit of God living within them. This book is a spiritual book. And so someone who doesn't have a, uh, has not yet been saved, has not yet been placed or born into the family of God and quickened by the Spirit of God, they don't have the Spirit of God to teach them and to instruct them in the Word of God and open their eyes to what the Word of God says, what the Bible says. So when their minds are seared with a hot iron, these false prophets, these cult leaders, they will be so cauterized, their minds will be so hardened that they will completely cut themselves off from the flow of truth, from the flow of what really is true. Instead of preventing infection, they will be heretics. They will prevent 
people from finding the truth, from coming to the knowledge of the truth. Jesus started his church. And every generation, there have been false prophets. There have been cult leaders who have appeared over these last 2,000 years. It's the church being attacked by Satan. Always remember this. False prophets is Satan rising up and having people that he uses to attack God, to attack Jesus, to attack the church. These attacks by Satan don't come from usually, now I know, just give me your mind if you will, I know we're going to look at scripture together and I'll turn to, have you turn to other scriptures, but just listen very carefully. Uh, I'm taking us on a little path in history here this morning. So just look this way and I'll take you on the path the best I can. But understand that most of the attacks of the devil when it comes to these false prophets are not pagan prophets. These aren't prophets who are worshiping false gods. These are those that the Bible talks about like this. These are false prophets who have the form of godliness but deny the power thereof. They have a form of Christianity. They have a form of what seems right. Uh, the, 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 uh, what I'm saying is this. Cult leaders emulate and look a lot like Christianity, like true Christian believers, like true Christian, the true Christian faith. That's why God calls it a falling away from the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. So it's like the faith we've been given, it's like it, but it's leaving or going away from the Christian faith. And that's the devil, the father of lies. That's how he works. He is the author of confusion. He's the one that's behind it all. To send people to hell. Understand, all over the last couple of hundred years, all of these cults, all of these false prophets who have led people in by the hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands to follow them. Understand something. The devil's goal in all of this is this. Just don't believe the knowledge of the truth. Just don't believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by him and him alone. That's the, the devil's whole goal is just, whatever he can do to convince every soul he can to trust in anything but the right way in order to have eternal life. So he sees the devil, sees that the Bible talks about the devil. His time is short. He knows his time is short. He knows that he, it's the latter days, and he knows that in those latter days, the Bible says that the devil is going to have many, in the latter times, many false religions and false prophets will spring up like never, ever before. It's a falling away from the Christian faith, but it still looks a little bit like Christianity is what it does. That's how the devil likes to do things, to draw people away or draw people in. These cults will call themselves Christian. They will look like Christianity. They will talk like they are part of the Christian faith, even using terms, even using words that sound like they are Christian, like any other Christian. Let me give you some words. Jesus tells his disciples, these groups will say, here is Christ. Believe them not. That's what he says right here. These groups, these leaders will say, there is Christ. Don't believe them. Don't trust in them. These false prophets will be so convincing, they will deceive. And if it were possible, what did we read in, in verse number 24? If it were possible, they will even convince the elect, the very child of God, to follow them. But God, Jesus calls it demonic. Jesus calls them false prophets. Christ. He calls them anti-Christs. Let's be reminded of many of these religious groups who have developed, been developed by cult followings, by cult leaders in the last days, these last couple of hundred years before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you a reminder. Let me say this. I've said this before. Let me say it again. Any religion started in America or in the last couple of hundred years, that's the latter times. That's the end times. I'll be very clear about it. If it's been started in America or it's been started in the last couple hundred years, you can go to the bank on this. Demonic. Satanic. My friends, Jesus started the local church how many years ago? 2,000 plus years ago. God gave us the Pentateuch. God gave us the first five books of the Bible many thousands of years ago. Folks, if something is starting up, a religion that's broken away from the Christian faith and has started up just in the last little while or started in the United States of America, you know something's not right. Satan is kicking. Satan is screaming, knowing he's on his way to the devil, his own hell that's been created for him and taking as many souls with him as he possibly can. 
By the way, whenever you hear someone be very frank about things like this, don't get mad at the preacher. Don't get mad at the messenger. It wasn't the preacher or the messenger who had a form of godliness, but without real power from the true gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of the gospel. The Bible says, for, uh, I, I, the, the, the Bible says I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. So to understand, the preacher's just the messenger. We're just doing as Peter did. We're trying our best to do what we need to do for God's people so we know the truth and we can compare what's not true to what is true. 1830, 1830. Founded in Fayette Township, New York, Mormonism. 1863, founded in Battle Creek, Michigan, Seventh-day Adventists. 1870, founded in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Jehovah's Witnesses. Founded in 1879, Cane Ridge, Kentucky, the Church of Christ. Founded in Topeka, Kansas, 1901, the Pentecostal Movement. Founded in 1930, Detroit, Michigan, the Nation of Islam. Founded in 1961, Boston, Massachusetts, Unitarianism. All of these latter time religions have a form of godliness. They look like Christianity in many ways. I think we all ought to pause and acknowledge that the devil has been awful busy in the last 194 years since he founded the Mormon religion in 1830. Many, many, think of how many souls has Satan led to eternal hell just through the major cults he started in the United States of America. Just these three alone, Mormonism, Islam, and Jehovah's Witnesses. Think about that. Just in the last hundred and some odd years, between Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the, the nation of Islam, think of how many people in the latter times in our own day the devil has convinced to trust in that which does not save. If Jesus said, believe them not, we're to believe them not. If they are false prophets, they are false prophets. They are so powerful, even a saved person, if possible, would be swept away by their teachings. And we are, just so we all are reminded again today, we are in the latter times. We are in the last days. We are in those days right before his coming. We might want to know what the devil has been up to. My friend, listen now. We might know. You have to listen on purpose this morning for the topic. We might want to know what the devil's been up to and be prepared for battle. We sang, uh, 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 what's the song we sang? Uh, the, the fight is on. We're in a battle. We're in a battle over the souls of men. God wants to use us to make sure that those that are lost out there, they know the true gospel and they know what it is to truly believe in in order for God to save their eternal soul. We're in a battle. We're in a battle and a war, a real war against a real devil who's trying to carry as many people along with him to hell that he can get. And we have an opportunity to make a difference. But we have to be prepared. We have to be armed. We have to be ready. We have to know what the enemy's doing. Amen. We were out soul winning about a month ago, and the whole street I went on that we had mapped out, almost every house they said, we are Jehovah's Witnesses. How heartbreaking. These sincere people, so many of them very sincere. Souls that are lost in sin. Always remember this. The Baptists don't have the answer. Right. Hello? Amen. I'm the pastor of New Hope Baptist Church. The Baptists don't have the answer. The Mormons don't have the answer, my friend. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't have the answer. There's one person and one person alone who has the answer, and that's Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one with the answer. Amen. Nobody else. And by the way, you go to a church or you go to a religion and they don't point you to Jesus and him alone and to look to him and follow him and he is the author and finisher of our faith and they want you, they want to draw you into their little organization or their little group and they don't point you to praise him and live for him and walk with him and love him and do everything you do, do it for him, then there's something wrong with that organization. Then there's something wrong with that leader. Then there's something wrong with that church. Amen. It's about him and he's the one with the truth. We're in the latter times. We're Jehovah's Witnesses. Heartbreaking. Jesus said we are to be wise about the cult groups who have reared their heads in these final days. So we take a few moments this morning and a little bit into the afternoon, not very far. So stay with me. Stay off your watch. Stay off your devices. Don't look to the phone. Don't look to the time. First of all, 
I'm going to look a few moments today and consider the Jehovah's Witnesses for a moment. First, this cult group was created by a man named Charles Taze Russell. He used to get his following, he started with a group of International Association of Bible Students in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and those were the founding members in 1870. This particular cult has had a number of different names. And you say, Pastor, why do you say so boldly and confidently you use the word cult when you mention Jehovah's Witnesses? Because I'm comparing what they believe to what God says in his word. That's it. The reason why I'll very comfortably say the word heresy is because we, God, this book right here is the truth. And if you deviate from the truth, you are living and believing error. This is the truth. I don't have the truth unless I have this book in me. That's the only way I have it. It's, I didn't come up with it. You didn't come up with it. This particular cult has had a number of different names. In 1874, they were called Millennial Dawn. But after they, ex they were exposed for their teachings, Russell changed, the leader, the founder, changed their name to Watchtower and Tract Society. Then they, were, they changed the name to the People's Pulpit Association. They were also known as Brooklyn Tabernacle. And just after Russell, their founder, passed, the name by the next leader was changed to the International Bible Students Association, and eventually that second leader changed the name to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Their founder, Charles Russell, could have had a great story. He started and had a great beginning, but instead he, his end ended up being a tragic one. Charles Russell grew up in a home in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania of God-fearing parents. D.L. Moody is, you look, anyone here who's an avid reader, look at the life of D.L. Moody and study his life. What a great story of God converting a shoe salesman to Christ and then how God turned Chicago upside down using him and others who came with him to see so many boys and girls. They would bring boys and girls in on horse buggy on Saturdays for Saturday, Sunday, Saturday school. And then it developed, God developed it into a church where they started meeting on Sunday. And then eventually he was all over Europe and all over the United States, God using him to bring people to Christ and stir revival in the hearts of God's people. Amazing story. Well, D.L. Moody was a congregationalist. Back in his day, they preached a very clear gospel of salvation. Well, that's Charles Russell. He grew up with God-fearing congregationalist parents. That's the home he grew up in. Charles Russell, he grew up in that home there in Pittsburgh. And as he was a young man, just still in his parents' home growing up as a young man, probably, I would say probably maybe Evan's age or so, or maybe Sam's age, just a young man still growing up in his parents' home, still very impressionable. And he became very fearful about hell. He was concerned and haunted, even in his thoughts and his dreams about, the, about hell, and he had a great fear of hell. Instead of coming to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, he listened to another man who convinced him that there was no such place as hell. There wasn't a hell. Hell that never existed. It's not a real place. After that, he bought what the man was selling and what he was teaching him, and Russell spent all of his waking hours as much as possible going to everybody he knew and trying to convince them that there was no hell. It's what he gave himself to. He became that brazen prophet as he got into his younger adult life seared, Mr. Russell, seared with a hot iron, cutting off the flow of all truth in his own life and in the life of others, altering the meaning of the Bible, altering the teachings of the Bible to suit his own purpose, his own purpose to draw people to himself and to draw a following. This man, he used exaggeration. He used salesmanship. He used hyperbole and rhetoric. It was 100 years ago. Understand, 100 years ago, Russell once promoted what he called miracle wheat. You understand, in 1972, a normal bushel of wheat sold for $1.57 in 1972. In 1800, a normal bushel of wheat sold for $1.82. He sold his miracle wheat for $60 a bushel. He called it miracle wheat. He, say he, com he, he convinced his followers that it grew five times faster than normal wheat did. <laughs> Here's the kicker. Only the faithful could make a purchase and get the miracle wheat. I mean, this man was very brazen. He famously carried on in adultery, but his wife found out about it. She divorced him. In order not to have to pay alimony, he transferred all of his property and assets to corporations and societies. And amazingly, 
the one who was in possession of all the corporations and societies, that it was the owner of those corporations and societies. Miraculously, it happened to be Charles Russell. Charles Russell. So he, didn't, he was avoiding paying his wife, ex-wife, alimony, for his sin and his adultery. That story of the Miracle Week brought another false prophet to mind on Friday when I was studying this out, Kenneth Copeland. I pulled up Kenneth Copeland's Twitter feed on X at 12.30 Friday afternoon in my office, and shocker, it read the following three posts, quote, three hours ago, he says, quote, Kenneth Copeland, three hours ago, if you need, if you have a need, sow a seed. You know what, whenever he says sow a seed and the other TV preachers say sow a seed, you know what they're saying? Uh, if you give us X gift, then you're sowing a seed for the Lord. It's a financial gift. Anytime he says that, anytime one of these preachers says, sow a seed, they're saying, give to me. Give me your money. That's exactly what they're saying. Same next post, also three hours ago, he says, quote, when what you have doesn't meet your need, then turn it into a seed. Another post, three hours ago, all at the same time. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. I thought about this. Uh, Kenneth, you, in the last 50 years, have fleeced God's flock for over a billion dollars. Truth. Spin a lot of it. That's why you know, there's only record of him being worth like $870 million. It's because he's spent a ton of it on extravagant things. But that was Charles Russell. That was the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. When Russell died in 1916, an ex-judge named Joseph Rutherford took over. He named them the Jehovah's Witnesses. Within six years, Rutherford stopped the sale of all of the founder's books that he had written and changed the names to Jehovah's Witnesses. He convinced all the followers that every one of them were part of God's final 144,000 witnesses even though the Bible says that they were of Jewish flesh and blood, and most of those followers of Mr. Rutherford were not Jewish at all. He convinced them all. This guy Rutherford was quite a character. He began going to San Diego, California every winter. During the winter months, how convenient, found his way to San Diego. Anyone ever visited San Diego, California? There's a reason why he ended up in San Diego. He bought a residence called Beth Sarin, the house, it means the house, the house of princes. He bought a mansion with 10 bedrooms. He told his followers this, quote, the bedrooms were needed to house patriarchs and prophets who would be resurrected, and they, need, they will need a place to stay. He named these prophets and, and, and former patriarchs. He said Moses will need a place to stay, and Abraham will need a place to stay, and David will need a place to stay, and Isaiah will need a place to stay, and Samuel will need a place to stay. Or in other words, since we don't have all the technology that we have in 2024, you don't need to know what's going on in this mansion, and I'm going to do what I want in this mansion with the people I want to do it with. It eventually became his full-time residence. Shocking. He predicted that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be resurrected in 1925 and would be representatives of the new order on earth. In the 1930s, a number of Jehovah's Witnesses gathered in New York City for a convention when a news correspondent who was a faithful Bible believer and knew what the Bible said and was a born-again believer, very intelligent Christian, was a reporter and reported about the convention and said this, quote, These Jehovah's Witnesses are, seem sincere. It is so unfortunate. How can they be so gullible and misguided? They repeat their teachings like with parrot-like fashion, with expressionless countenances. Quote, they may not know it, but these people are doing more harm to the Christian world than the communists are doing to the Christian world. And they call themselves Christian. End quote. Isn't that the truth? Many of us who have gone out witnessing over and over again, giving people the gospel, telling people how to go to heaven, this to me really rang true 
parrot-like, even the 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds that I've witnessed to and, and tried to show the way of salvation to uh, that, are, that are steeped in the Jehovah's Witness religion, uh, parrot-like in repeating their teachings like it's been drilled into them over and over and over again, over and when the Baptists come around, when the Christian, other Christians come around, when others that aren't us and they aren't one of us, 144,000, when they come, this is what you say, this is what you say, expressionless faces, like they've been drugged in a sense with some powerful narcotic that has just controlled them in what they say and how they say and, 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 and the words that they use. Secondly, how did this cult doctrine of Jehovah's Witnesses, how did it all get concocted? Their doctrine, their poisonous doctrine was brewed by, understand something, these false religions, Satan is behind it all. No matter how sincere people are, no matter how kind they are, no matter how loving they are, no matter how generous they are, what matters is, thus saith the Lord. What matters is, what does God say in his word? Everything we do, we, and other, other people do around us, we have to compare it, whether it's true or not, to what does God say? Let me give us some great statements made by a few of the great preachers through history once the Jehovah's Witnesses came on the scene. One of the great preachers back in DL Moody, after D.L. Moody that took the Moody Church in Chicago, his name is H.A. Ironside. I have a number of his, uh, his uh, document or a number of his uh, commentaries in my office and use them pretty frequently. H.A. Ironside said this about the Jehovah's Witnesses. He said this and their teachings and their leaders. This is indeed a religion of perdition. Look up the word perdition sometime. And its teachings are rightly labeled damnable heresy from such turn away. A well-respected pastor, a Baptist pastor, A.C. Dixon, who worked with R.A. Torrey, another man very highly respected, was once a lawyer, got saved, gave up being a lawyer, making all sorts of money, and gave himself to be a preacher of the gospel and, and went both on America and other continents preaching the gospel and sparking revival all across the world. And this man, this pastor, worked with R.A. Torrey and helped him publish his, uh, his, his, uh, um, his um, article called The Fundamentals, where we get the name fundamentalism. And here this pastor said this about Russellism. And those who are very familiar with Jehovah's Witnesses know the phrase Russellism. That's a common phrase that's used for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Is Russellism is the same thing, the name of their founder, Charles Russell. Here's what this pastor Dixon said, this Baptist pastor. During the day of the rise of Jehovah's Witnesses, he said, Russellism's plan for salvation is a plan of damnation. A plan of damnation. My, my friend, it doesn't matter. Anything that adds or takes away from the only way to heaven, that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Anything you add to it keeps whoever trusts in that from salvation, from heaven. Their cult doctrine started with a volume of books. Understand this. Their cult, their cult, i got to keep my phone out because of time. I may, we may have part two tonight. We probably will. Their cult doctrine started with a volume of seven books. It was a publication by their founder, Charles Russell. And the I'm going to have you repeat this with me. His volume of seven books was called The Studies in the Scripture. Say that. The Studies in the Scripture. Say it one more time. The Studies in the Scriptures. Here's what Russell said about his seven volumes of books that he wrote called the studies in the scriptures. He said about his books, quote, they are practically the Bible. They are not merely comments on the Bible. They are practically the Bible itself, end quote. Quote, people cannot see God's divine plan for their life by studying the Bible itself. Within two years of only studying the Bible, they will go dark. But merely reading my scripture studies, the study of the scriptures that I wrote, and not reading the Bible at all, they will come to the light within two years. End quote. Friends, who else hates God's word like Charles Russell did? Who else hates the word of God and changes the word of God and pushes people away from the word of God like Charles Russell did? Satan, of course. What did Satan say in the Garden of Eden? Say it with me. Yea, hath God said. Say it again. Ready? Yea, hath God said. 
Russell tells us, quote, in his seven volumes, it's much better to ignore the Bible completely and study just my books. Me personally, I'm, we're going to close uh, here in just a few moments, and then we'll pick up tonight. And I pray if you can come back and get the rest of this tonight, I pray that you will. Russell tells us, quote, it's much better just to ignore the Bible. I like what Isaiah the prophet in the Bible says. Isaiah the prophet. Who, if you have a choice between trusting the words of Charles Russell or trusting the words of the great Isaiah, the mighty prophet of God of the Old Testament, let's see what Isaiah said. Isaiah said this, quote, if, they, anyone who, if a prophet or anyone who speaks not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. End quote. Isaiah 8, verse 20. I prefer, instead of listening to Charles Russell and his comments about the Bible and not reading the Bible, I prefer to listen to the great King David. It's King David who sat on the throne of Israel as the one man that God says was a man after my own heart. And what does it say from the mouth of King David? Quote, God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Charles Russell started to Jehovah's Witnesses and said, if you read just the Bible and study just the Bible, you're going to turn to darkness. Just don't, don't read the Bible and just read what I wrote, and you're going to turn to light. And yet God, through the insp God inspired David to write the very words that God had already gave us or already settled in heaven, gave to David, and it's just the opposite of what Charles Russell was teaching. Amen. The only way to have light is the Word of God. The Word of God is the lamp. The Word of God is the light to light our path. Third, we're not going to have time to do it, and I want to, I'll get into it tonight. We should see what the Jehovah's Witnesses actually say about doctrines in the Bible. Let me give you one example, and then we'll go ahead and go to the invitation for this morning. Let's see what, and I'm going to have you turn with me to a scripture or two. I'm sorry we didn't go to as much scripture this morning. What is the, what are the, what are, what is the Jehovah's Witness teaching and belief on the Trinity? Somebody help me. What is the Trinity? It's that the Bible teaches this. The Father in heaven and his son Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are three separate persons Yet all of them are the same one God. One God, three persons, Father, say it with me, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, what does their founder, Charles Russell, what did he teach them from the beginning? What did he say about this triune God? Anyone here love God the Father, your Father in heaven? Say amen. Amen. Anyone here love God the Son who gave himself for you and died, dipped his soul into hell and suffered hell and suffered all of our sins upon his own body on the cross and suffered all of that for us? Anyone here love Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world? Anyone want to say amen to that? Amen. You love Jesus? Anyone here love the Holy Spirit who lives within us, who gives us the power to overcome sin, who gives us the guidance and the instruction to be able to even understand and illuminate the words of God so we can understand the will of God for our life through the leading of the Holy Spirit to teach us what is the will of God through the Word of God? Anyone here have a love for the Holy Spirit of God here in this house today? Anyone like that? Say amen. amen. Here's what he says, quote, Here's what he says. I'm quoting from volume five. I know we've got to finish. Volume five of his studies in the scriptures, Charles Russell says on page 166, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity of the Godhead did well in the dark ages, which the Trinity doctrine helped to produce. It's the doctrine of the Trinity that helped produce the dark ages. The Trinity, quote, the Trinity teaching is as unscriptural as it is unreasonable. This Trinitarian nonsense, quote, this Trinitarian nonsense was drilled into us from infancy and still taught by gray-haired professors in theological seminaries or nobody on earth would give the Trinity a moment's consideration at all, end quote. You see what Russell's doing? You see what Satan is doing? 
trying to remove the deity of Christ, trying to remove the fact that Jesus is God, Try, the devil himself trying to bring Jesus down to the level of another person or another being who was truly created himself. The devil, anything he can do to bring Jesus and him to the same level, it's exactly what the devil does. He calls those words we just quoted from him the real Bible. He says the real Bible, his words, say that the Trinity is unscriptural. It's just pounded into our heads since we were infants that it must be right. It must be true. I mean, this man is literally a lunatic. He was a lunatic. He was a Bible hater. Understand something about Charles Russell, the leader and founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. He hated the words of God. He rejected the words of God. He rejected that hell was a real place. He rejected that Jesus was Christ, that Jesus was God on earth. The Bible, what, what is the word Jesus? Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. God with us. That's what Emmanuel means. That's what the word Emmanuel means. So let's end with this. What does the Bible say about the Trinity? What does the Bible, stop with this this morning or early afternoon. What does the Bible say about the Trinity? Go to Genesis chapter 1, please. Go there quickly. I know we're done. We're out of time. We're at 1204. If my phone is tied to the same satellite as yours is, I've got 12.04 in a few seconds. Some of you maybe have the timer pulled up by the second, and so you can give me more accurate time right now than 12.04, or in some cases maybe more accurate than 12.05 if it changes in a sec. You're in Genesis 1.26, and what do the words of Genesis 1.26 say at the beginning of our Bible? God said, let... God is speaking now about himself. Let, next word... Make man in, next word, our. image, after, our. okay, so you have us, our, our, this is Jehovah God in creation, as he's creating the world, he's saying, when you think of me, think of me in the plural, when you think of me, don't think of me as one, think of me as us, think of God as plural pronoun, we, us, not me, not I, Turn to Genesis 11, please. Genesis 11, please. Genesis 11. Look at verse 7. Here is man trying to build a tower up to heaven themselves. They're all gathered together in one language uh, here at the Tower of Babel, and they're all doing whatever they want to do, and they're forgetting God completely. So God is going to go down, and he's going to give them all different languages so that they have to be scattered across the whole earth so that they will not continue in their sin and their wickedness together to do all that's in the, the, that they would imagine to do. And when God is about to come down and confound all their languages, give them all different languages, and scatter them across the earth, what does God say? He says, when I come down, Here's how I'm going to do it. Go to, let, next word, go down. And there confound their language here at the Tower of Babel. Again, Jehovah speaking of himself in plural form. In right there, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Go to Isaiah 6, 8. I said we're finishing up with this one thought. What does the Bible say? What does God say about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost all being God? Three separate persons of God, and yet the one same God. Go to Isaiah 6 and verse 8, please. Isaiah 6 and verse 8, please. If you're fast with your fingers, go to Matthew chapter 3 also. Isaiah 6, 8. Matthew 3. Isaiah 6, 8, please. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse number 8. Let's read that together. Ready? I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? This is the Lord now. Whom shall I send? And who will go for? Plural. There it is. God is not just God the Father. God is in triune form. God is in three persons, but yet the same God. Again, the Trinity, straight out of the mouth of Jehovah himself in Isaiah 6, 8. Matthew 3, please, verse 16. Jesus is getting baptized to be our example. Matthew chapter 3, please, verse 16, and it says he was baptized. Matthew 3 and verse 16 and 17. Jesus was baptized and the heavens were open. And the Bible says he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. And lo, what does it say? Lo, a voice from heaven saying, say it with me, This is my beloved Son in whom 
I am well pleased. So here's Jesus. Picture it with me, if you will. He gets baptized. He comes up out of the water. There's the Holy Spirit like a dove hovering over him. And then the voice from heaven isn't the Holy Spirit, and it isn't Jesus, the Son of God. It's God the Father in heaven speaking. So here you have all in one event, all in one moment, you have there God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all three in one There's a lot we could go on and on about. I'm going to talk about tonight a number of things and bring it uh, to a close this evening. But let me ask you something. What if this preacher says, well, you know what, God, this is what God says. This is right. Brother Troy, should you believe me just because I say, you know, just quote a verse and I just quote it. Do you just assume that I'm right? What did the Brian church do? They searched the scriptures that they might know that what they were hearing was from the Word of God. Don't ever 100%, 100% trust that sinful men are right. We're all sinners. None of us are perfect. My family will gather around and we'll tell stories. Andrew, Andrew's in our home as he's finishing up his college years in our home, and him and mom and I will be gathering around, and we'll be talking about some event. That can, and uh, he'll give some facts. I'll give some facts. Mom will give some facts. Usually they have a few more facts that they know about than I do. And, uh, but we'll be giving facts and things. And then it'll be maybe two days later or the next day or maybe a couple hours later that some of our facts we find out at different times some of his facts were not right on. Some of my facts were not right on. Some of mama's facts we're not right on. There's a family member on which side of the family, I won't say it, it really doesn't matter. And they are very, I'm talking, I'm not talking about in my son's generation or my generation, but they're just convinced that they know, that they know, that they know, that they know about any topic, that they know the answer for it, and there is no need ever for a discussion any beyond this point. I'm going to make the statement. I'm going to put a period or an exclamation point on it. When I'm done then we can all move on with our lives because I've finished the discussion for us. And how many times have we found? Has that person found? Well, I maybe did want to be right instead of being the one that was right instead of being accurate, being accurate. We don't come to New Hope Baptist Church to our pulpit and abuse this pulpit by criticizing and blasting away against there's in the Jehovah's Witness cult there are very sincere people who are doing their very best to serve God with all their heart and all their life many of them go house to house and door to door every week of their life for hours boy that's a convicting thing for me that brings me under conviction but it's our role and responsibility before God as preachers of his word and messengers of the truth. We are, honored, we are bound by God. I will one day stand and give an account that I have preached the whole counsel of the word of God. And I find, because we're in the end times, I'm sorry, we're in the latter days and the latter times, that I am bound by God to say what Peter said, to say what Paul said, to say what other preachers have said way back 2,000 years ago. Remind, reminded by God over and over again, false prophets will come. I was going to mention it tonight. You know what Jesus called the false prophets? To their face, <laughs> in public gatherings, he looked at the scribes and Pharisees and said, you are hypocrites. You are men full of, you're, you're full of dead men's bones. That was Jesus. Why? Why would he be that way? Because those spiritual leaders were false prophets leading people away from the truth. Do you believe there's a real heaven? According to God's word, say amen. amen. Do you believe there's a real hell where people who die without God burn forever and ever and ever and ever? I'll leave you this is one thought as we go to our invitation this morning. Say, it's not this morning anymore, Pastor. I've been checking my watch like you told me not to. I've been looking back at the clock like you told me not to. Do you understand that Jesus, when he preached, the 
person in the Bible who warned of hell more than anyone else. And when you add it all up, it's not close. Anyone want to guess the one person who warned us about the fires of hell and the punishment of hell more than anyone else? Anyone want to take a wild guess? It wasn't close second place. The Lamb of God who died and shed his blood so that we don't have to go there. That makes sense, doesn't it? The one who was going to die, he was about to die for the sins of the whole world, and he knew everything. Doesn't that only make sense? The one who would go there to pay for our sins? Wouldn't it make sense that he'd be the one talking about it the most? That only adds up. It makes sense that he would. By far, it was Jesus who warned the world, it's a real place. It's a real place. And anything the devil can do to get anybody to believe anything but to trust in Jesus to save them, the devil is doing it. Here's a man who started this religion, and it was founded on this belief that there is no hell. The Jehovah's Witness cult religion was founded on this one belief, there is no hell. Who are we going to believe? Russell or the Redeemer of the world? Would you bow your heads with me? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I do pray during this time of invitation, if there is someone in our midst who does not know your son Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day for them to be saved. Lord, I do pray your blessing upon the truth of your word. Lord, I don't want to bring a wrong or a bad spirit without the spirit of Christ toward a topic that's so important as this one is. Lord, you spoke on blessed, blessed is the one who hungers and thirsts after righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. Oh, you talked about how we're to love one another. But then... Just a moment later in the same sermon, you warned of the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. You warned of eternal judgment. You warned of a fire that will never go out before it's too late so that we do not go to that place. Lord Jesus, we trust your word. We know that you're right. We know that the Bible is true. We're not Catholic because we've always been Catholic and our family's always been Catholic. We're not Baptist because we've always been Baptist because our family was always Baptist. We are Bibleists. We believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God and we trust your word as pure and true and right and we know that it is the authority, the final authority is not the pastor. It's the word of God and we trust it. We know that it's true. Lord, help us to know what the devil is up to. What the devil is up to by comparing what he's doing to what the Bible says. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. We're going to have the invitation. We're going to stand in just a moment. It's about uh, 15 after, and that's fine. We're going to stand in just a moment when we do. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I pray that when the piano plays and we stand to our feet, that you'll find an aisle closest to you. Come down to the front, like others have done, and say, I want to be sure that I'm on my way to heaven. And if you, maybe there's another decision. You look at the Jehovah's Witness followers and you see how aggressively they promote their doctrine their uh, doctrines that are not true that do not line up with the bible that are not accurate at all they're erroneous they're her- they her- it's her- her- heresy going against the faith and going against the word of god and yet they're so aggressive how about you say i need to do my part I need to get out and, co- and compel people to trust Jesus as their Savior. I've got the truth, and I'm not doing much with the truth. Maybe that's the message for you today from the Lord. Let's stand to our feet, please. Miss Dinah, if you will go ahead and have our invitation song. The altar is open. The altar call is given. A little longer than our normal Sunday morning service, but we'll let the Spirit of God do His work. How much time do we give to God in church compared to the rest of the hours of our week? It's very small compared to the rest of life that God gives us outside these doors. Study, my friend. 